Hello, welcome to On Point. I'm Mandy Martins. On this edition of On Point, we'll be speaking with MPP Michael Mantha of Algoma, Manitoulin, and we'll do that right after these commercial messages. Welcome back to On Point. I'm Andy Martins. Uh, for this edition, we'll be speaking with MPP Michael Mantha, and he joins me now. Mike, it's a pleasure. Welcome back to On TV and On Point. Great uh, to always, have you here. Always a pleasure to join you. Thanks very much. I feel the same way. Let's uh, start with this. Uh, Bombardier, it's a timely story right now going in Thunder Bay. Uh, a lot of the jobs may be lost. A lot of people are angry that the Doug Ford government has once again dropped the ball on this. Uh, what, what are your thoughts with this whole issue uh, in Thunder Bay? Well, it's a pattern that we're seeing with this government not getting involved. And uh, by the time they do move on something, the issue has sailed on. And it's unfortunate that they're not going into action. Uh, you see Northern Ontario that's being once again devastated, uh, where for whatever reason, Northern Ontario is not on the radar with this government. We, uh, we've been asking this government, uh, at least we campaigned on it in the last election, it was part of our platform, and I believe it was part of the Conservative platform as well, was to re return passenger rail systems uh, to Northern Ontario right. uh, and better transportation across uh, this province. And there was a perfect opportunity in order to build the infrastructure through Bombardier. Why would we have to look anywhere else but in our own backyard? This would have been an opportunity in order to save those jobs and to actually stimulate our economies in Northern Ontario. But once again, uh, this government is MIA. Exactly. And there were people here in Sault Ste. Marie, too, that were fighting for that. And it's time to step up with, uh, you know, we uh, uh, Ross Romano and uh, Vic Fidelli. But you're right. Uh, those requests would have been perfect. And uh, they seem to be focused on the TTC and subways. And they're just not in tune with northern Ontario. No, you're right, they're not. And it's unfortunate because it's not like we're asking for anything more, but we're certainly not going to accept anything less. Our transportation system, our corridors that we have here is our highways, our roads, and what we'd like to see is a diversity of that. By returning marine, uh, by having more uh, uh, aerial, and also returning passenger rail. Uh, it is needed. Uh, there have been plenty of studies. There are many organizations out there who are actively pursuing this. And we'd like to have a, a, an ear. We'd like to see this government move on this issue and to return this uh, system to uh, Northern Ontario. Exactly. Let's move on to our, uh, Ross Romano is now Minister of Colleges and Universities. And we were talking before the broadcast that really Ross needs to step it up here. And he's already getting uh, uh, on the wrong foot with the OSAP issue. Can you enlighten our viewers as to what that entails? Well, first, I want to congratulate Ross first on his appointment. It's always nice to see a Northern member getting uh, this type of portfolio in high profile. However, again, uh, what's disappointing is that he needs to step into his role now. And now he's going to have a larger voice uh, at the cabinet table. And to make sure that OSAP students and education is on the radar and to stop the cuts that are happening because our schools and our children and our students are the ones that are going to be are, are going to be the the ones receiving the negative impacts of the decisions this government is making right right exactly and uh, the students are not very happy with the osap uh, rules as well at the moment no it's hard enough like the biggest issues that that i hear day in day out from a variety of student organizations that visit me over at queen's park is at the top is mental health um, the other one is tuition fees and the fact that the government is cutting for some 50 to 80 percent of their tuition their loans um, is just unacceptable this is just going to add to more anguish for the students and more more distress and just more anxiety when they should be focusing on their studies right right exactly and uh, unless you get a reset here and get it balanced up uh, it's not going to cure itself is it really 
No, it, and it's a matter of getting your priorities straight. Like I believe, I choose to believe uh, that you know where all the MPPs are serving across this province, and what makes us different uh, from party to party is where those priorities lie. And uh, it needs to be, this priority needs to be heightened within this uh, Ford cons Conservative government. And uh, students need to be recognized, they need to be respected. And those, uh, the, the grants and the tuitions, uh, the OSAP needs to be returned to a level that will be uh, beneficial to those students. Right, exactly. Let's move on to the cronyism of the Premier's office. I've been living in this province all my life and never have I seen this kind of cronyism with Peter Fenwick, was a friend of Dean French's transformation officer, fired $320,000 job, Dean French, uh, King of Cerna's father, and so on and so forth. Hey, this is unprecedented, Mike. Have you ever seen this kind of cronyism with any government? Well, you certainly uh, have to say that the Ford government is laying down new grounds and a new path towards this uh, type of politics. And this is really what um, people are so disconnected with and people are so frustrated with. And when they look at their government and they look at it in, in a negative light, um, I got involved in the politics to try in politics to try to change things, to be a different politician, to not only oppose but to propose. And when you see this type of action, it just it just leads people to saying like this government or or all politicians are the same. And it's unfortunate that this government has not learned from the various scandals that have happened from the previous government and them creating a whole bunch of new scandals that are going on. Exactly, and you throw Lisa McLeod in there who's getting into trouble, Vic Fideli got demoted. It's just a reset because, and it puts the NDP caucus in a tough position too, being in a majority government and opposition. How do you deal with this kind of inept cronyism? Well, you stay focused. Like uh, I'm the MPP for Algoma Manitoulin. My issues uh, vary from uh, other areas across this province, but at the, at the biggest issues has always been healthcare in our infrastructure, our roads, education. Those are the things that are, are near and dear to everybody across this province. Uh, we've just released our, our new discussion paper in regards to the new Green Deal. Um, it's going to start a discussion in regards to what we're going to need as we move forward to addressing the environment issues. I'm looking forward to engaging with organizations, businesses, individuals uh, across the province over the course of the summer. But again, for me, it's touching each and every part of my writing and also uh, touching other parts of this province because as you said, there's a majority conservative government right now, and if right. we are going to form the next government, we need to make sure that we hear from all corners of the province. You need to start planning now in 2019 for 2022. Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, that's uh, as soon as the, the election was finished, uh, that's what I was doing, is uh, planning for the next election. <laughs> right, exactly. You've been at it now eight plus years, yep. and um, it's a, it's a great thing when you you know the job and such, but you you never know what kind of challenges. Uh, is it a long time to be off, uh, Mike? Uh, you're not going back to Queen's Park until a week after the um, federal election. Is that an unusually long time to be off? Yeah, it is uh, unusual, and I think this is part of the Ford, uh, you know, Mr. Shear plan is to <laughs> yeah, silence exactly. uh, Mr. Ford so he doesn't get into any more trouble because it seems everything that he does puts a negative impact on the federal uh, campaign that is going to be coming up. So they're putting him under a witness protection program <laughs> is what I assume. But um, again, yeah, not having access to directly to the ministers because that's one of the things that I enjoy the most is leaving my seat from uh, the opposition and walking across, uh, talking to some of the ministers, having a discussion either in the corridors, on the, you know, off, off to the side so you can have that direct link and an immediate answer to your issue. Um, you know, those are the challenging things because we're going to be away from Queen's Park for such a long time. Um, the fact that we've got a whole new slate of uh, certain ministers that are there as well as establishing your liaisons with those individuals and the new people that are going to be within the ministry and the bureaucracy. Um, you, uh, uh, over the course of years, I've, I've learned to build my bridges and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, heading back um, after the federal election. 
Does it uh, affect uh, the minister changes, cabinet shuffle? Does it affect the, um, your caucus critics? Would those change as well or not? It, it may. The leader may uh, look at uh, different uh, individuals. Uh, you know, she may look at changing things. Uh, this summer, we're going to have our caucus retreat. Uh, in August, we're going to be having it up in Thunder Bay. And uh, at that point in time, we're going to re-strategize ourselves in regards to what we're going to do in the fall session leading into uh, the, uh, the winter session. Also, we're going to talk about some of the feedback that we're getting from constituents so that we could prepare ourselves uh, going into the uh, next session. So uh, it may, but that's, uh, that's a decision that's up to our leader, Andrew Horvath. And uh, it may come down before or after you get back to Queen's Park. Yeah, it may. Again, that's a decision that the leader will take. And also, we forgot one more thing. Hydro One has become a mess too, where he's, your know, premier is a six million dollar man, and now apparently it's a hundred and fifty million dollar mess. Well, yeah, it's it's kind of funny where you hear the uh, four government claiming that they fixed the issue, where they turned in the six million dollar man into a nine million dollar man. <laughs> I don't know how that addresses the issues, but yeah. where you have, you know, th this government likes to throw uh, the uh, liberal government uh, in regards to their scandal and their spending habits. Right. But when you actually look at the numbers and you follow where those dollars are going, this conservative government is not uh, being shy in regards to how they're spending their money. Exactly. Definitely, definitely not. Um, stay right there, Mike. We'll take a quick uh, commercial break and we'll be right back with uh, MPP Michael Mantha right after these messages. Welcome back to On Point. I'm Andy Martins. We're having a delightful time chatting with MPP of Algoma, Manitoulin, Michael Mantha. And uh, Mike, you were telling me before the broadcast that um, there's some wonderful jobs in Northern Ontario that people may not know about. Uh, if you want to let our viewers know uh, what's going on. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the issues that I have uh, across Algoma, Manitoulin, and there's a huge need for labor, service, uh, service jobs. If you look at the northern communities, uh, basically from Shaplow to Walwa to White River to the Horn Payne, there's lots of mining and forestry opportunities because the mining and the forestry sector has taken off once again. And right now, a lot of the community members that were there that were in the service sectors have moved into those good paying jobs, but there's still jobs that are available in all those sectors. But it's the supporting jobs as well, you know, housekeeping, restaurant, cooks, uh, and so on. And again, just on uh, Manitoulin Island, there's lots of tourism opportunities that are there as well. Manitoulin Transport is looking for a lot of uh, management jobs uh, as far as uh, specialty skills, HR, accountants, and so on. It's, uh, it's a good time to be in Nalgoma, Manitoulin, I'll tell you that much. Wow, and that's not really that far away from Sault Ste. Marie. So if you're looking for a job, folks, that's not that far away. To uh, uh, Manitoulin Transport's located uh, on the island, of their head office, I believe. Yeah, their head office is in Gorby. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of uh, the island. Uh, mind you, there's, there's no bad part to Manitoulin Island. It's a wonderful, magical place. Uh, they've got great competitive rates and benefits, so if you're looking for a good management uh, job, it's, uh, it's a good place to start looking for work. I'll tell you, I think you've got the best riding in the province, uh, Mike, for sure. <laughs> tell me about your uh, recent journey of 40 kilometers right in your riding. Uh, it sounds like a very exciting trip. Well, it was an inciting trip. It was the uh, inaugural uh, Canoe Fest race. It was organized by uh, uh, Killarney Mountain Lodge and the Manitoulin Brewery. Um, it was a 40 kilometer track. We left uh, from uh, Little Current. We crossed the Morning Bridge and we tracked into uh, Killarney. It was roughly a 40 kilometer paddle. Wow. We had a lot of headwinds, large waves, but we made it through and uh, most boats may still made it through in about uh, five to six hours and it was a just a fabulous track. It was just um, nothing like feeling alive when you accomplish something like that. Unbelievable. I've taken the trip many times in the 90s my, when my uh, father used to live in Collingwood to take a shortcut and that's a beautiful part of the province. It really is. 
Uh, I, I, I'm blessed um, and it's a privilege to seeing all of the areas that I have across my writing. It's, it's uh, nice to stand and take my seat over at Queen's Park when I hear other MPPs, they have uh, nice areas as well. But to be honest with you, I know I have the best writing in, in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You wouldn't switch with the leader or anybody in Toronto to uh, switch up the writing. I don't blame you. No, nah, every single of the 37 municipalities and 22 First Nations that I have, uh, I love every single one of them. But there's still an employment imbalance with this government between north and south. Can you speak to that a little bit? They just haven't got it done in the last year. Yeah, no, and it's something that I'm hoping like this government is 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 saying the right things, and it's going to make sure that those programs are going to be in place. And it's bringing we're going to need a, a whole slew of of new immigrants to come uh, to fill a lot of the jobs that we have here in Northern Ontario because we just don't have the manpower. We just don't have enough hands to put in at all the jobs that we have here. So what they have to do is to set up some type of an incentive program so that individuals can come from Southern Ontario to Northern Ontario. And we not only need those in, in labor and in service providers, but we also need those in, in healthcare providers. We need doctors, mm -hmm. we need nurses, we need PSWs, and we need people to take care of our seniors. So um, they're, like I said, they're saying the right things, but the proof will be in the pudding once they start rolling out these programs. It's, it's, if you're going to come out and talk, and not go into action, that is not a fruitful exercise. Are we not taking advantage of the forestry in Northern Ontario or getting our bang for our buck in some of these uh, industries that can be fruitful for the North? Well, coming out of the forest sector, uh, as you know, Andy, I was, uh, I was in the sector for roughly about 15 years. I started my career at the uh, Gogamera Ostrom Mill. It used to be right. owned by uh, Day Forest Product. It is now owned by Econ. And uh, there is huge potentials for forestry in, in Northern Ontario. Good, sustainable practices will make sure that forestry is around for years to come. And the companies that we do have right now are practicing very good, sustainable practices. Right, exactly. And it, it, the government should focus a little bit more on that. Oh, absolutely. You know, when you have a government that takes away, like we had a program that was planting uh, three out of every tree that we're cutting and they've decided to cut that program and rely only on the private sector for planting the trees that we have. There's a lot of private sector areas where planting is not going on and these programs used to put in the trees that were there. It's unfortunate that this Ford government has canceled programs like that because it generated jobs, it provided students with experience, it, 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 it addressed a lot of the shortfalls that we're seeing are in our environment. So again, it's a matter of priority and this government needs to get its priorities straight. Exactly. Uh, moving on to healthcare a little bit, um, our viewers might be wondering where is this government with these healthcare m changes and cuts and have you heard it doesn't seem to be moving very quickly during the summer? Well, it's unfortunate that, you know, those priorities again um, are are not at the top of their list. Uh, again, you hear announcements of things that are going to change, but at the end of the day, what we see is cuts, and we right. see less of our nurses that are working in, in the hospitals, we see less of our front-end workers, PSWs, we see cuts that are kind of coming to seniors programs, right. and all of this is going to lead to greater and, and longer wait lists. We don't see any recruitment programs that are coming out of this doctor, particularly from Northern Ontario. We see students that are coming out of our schools that have no places to go in order for them to practice to get the experience that they need. So it just begs to, for you to, to, to say that, where are we? Where is this government yeah, when it comes to Yeah, a lot of people are wondering, when is this gonna happen? And I don't think the patient-based healthcare system is going to be fast-tracked anytime soon. This may be a five-year process from what I'm hearing. Oh, it's gonna be an extremely long process. And when you look, particularly here in Northern Ontario, each and every other community, and, and I just finished a full round of constituency clinics in my writing and right. several of the people are saying like, our doctors are aging. The doctors are looking to rightfully retire. However, who's gonna step up and who's gonna to come to Northern Ontario and where are those new doctors that we need 
in order to fill the needs that we have across northern Ontario. Exactly. The government, I think, needs to do better planning. And, uh, you know, in terms of they know some of these doctors, like you say, are retiring, but not allow people in northern Ontario just to be left without a doctor when they a doctor says they're retiring, they get sick, or they move to Ottawa, and then 2,000 patients are left orphaned. Uh, you know, the better planning can avoid some of these situations. Yeah, and you look at NOSM, uh, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine that we have uh, in, in Thunder Bay. Let's take advantage of the opportunities that we have there and let's make sure that we have placements for those doctors you know, throughout the province and particularly here in Northern Ontario where we see a huge, huge need right. uh, within the North Shore, uh, along uh, within our First Nations as well. Right, right. We've talked about this before, Mike, but it might be worth repeating for our viewers. Um, they might wonder, well, how does Michael Mantha plan to get around a big riding like Algoma, Manitoulin? And you know how to do your job, my friend, and maybe let the viewers know how you get around this riding in your riding in a monthly basis. Well, on average, if I'm uh, going to be traveling around, um, I try my best to get to each and every of the communities at least two or three times a year. Um, and the only way I get around is uh, with a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And on average, you're looking at about five to 6,000 kilometers a month. And that's, that's, I'm not complaining about that. That's what I need to do. And it's always nice. People are always asking me, why do you go to all the fish fries and barbecues and birthday parties and <laughs> right. yard sales? Well, that's where I meet up with people because people don't always know to come to their MPP or to their federal member. Um, it's when you meet them on their time where you have that five minute discussion where you step aside from where people are gathering. And for me, it's a, sometimes it's a five, 10 minute issue that I need to fix or a phone number or a resource I need to provide them with. Uh, where they're carrying this burden and this stress and I have the ability to change it or, or to fix it or to, to give it on to my staff in order for us to do a little bit of research. That's why you do what we do and why I love so much what I do. Well, you do a great job and you've got it under control. Uh, are we being hurt by not having the Liberals as the third party at Queen's Park? Uh, we, you know, we've talked about the minority, majority governments being a little bit toxic now because this government can do what it wants. Would it be helpful to have the Liberals there as a third party if, uh, rather than not? Well, the Liberal MPPs that are there, although they're sitting as an independent, they don't have an official party status. I'm sure or I'm hopeful that they're serving their constituents the same way as I am, as being the right. official opposition, as an MPP that is sitting in government. Um, their voices uh, should be heard as, uh, as any other voice inside the House. Um, how they organize themselves within their own caucus um, and how they strategize things is somewhat different than ours is. Their priority right now is maybe a leadership is what they need. Um, our priority is holding this government to account and making sure that we, as I said earlier, that we're not just opposing, which I, is a role that I take quite seriously because as an opposition, that's our role is to listen to constituents and listen to people across this province and, and bring the concerns that they have in regards to the policy decisions that this government is making, but also to propose is to give options, is to give ideas, is to give visions as far as what an NDP government would look like had right. we been elected and what an NDP government will look like in 2022 in the next election. That's right, and people need to know that now and they can uh, plan for it and then make a decision in 2022 which, which way to go uh, type of thing. Um, one final question, uh, briefly, uh, what is the biggest challenge for Ontario in 2019, in your opinion? Health, I, I think it's not a culmination of once the, what's the biggest issue, I think is providing good health care, um, making decisions instead of impacting people negatively. Um, and, the private, and where this government is going is towards a fee-for-service and the privatization or for-profit model of our healthcare. That's going to be the biggest challenge that we have as Ontarians 
uh, fighting this for government because it's part of their DNA. Privatization, let's not right. kid ourselves, that's part of the conservative agenda. They believe that the private sector can do the jobs better than anybody else. And don't get me wrong, there's always room for privatization, but our essential services, as far as our healthcare, our energy, um, our roads, our schools, those are things that we hold near and dear to us. It's part of who we are, not only as Ontarians, but as Canadians. And where this government is going is wrong. Right, and, and that's right. We're a proud province and we've done it uh, the, the, the way and that we need to keep it going that way. Michael, it's been a thrill to have you on the show. We'll do it again real soon. Thank you for making time for us. As always, my pleasure, Andy. Thank you very much. That's MPP Michael Mantha from Algoma, Manitoulin. And that's, we'll be back right after these messages to wrap up the show. Thanks for being with us. I really appreciate MPP Michael Mantha for being here. And we'll see you next time on On Point. I'm Andy Martins. Thanks for watching. Take care.